Okay, so let's get started. So today what we're going to do is we're going to continue or kind of like actually start what we did on Friday. So it's going to be the DE1 uh, NIOS processor, so NIOS 2, but we're going to do um, interrupt uh, PS2 keyboard and mouse. And also VGA, okay. So this is from Friday, and over the weekend I got this to work. Like it took me like a couple of hours. So, and I placed the reference design online. So again, we'll rediscuss this. So if you go under week six to ten on the Digital Systems website, well, if it'll ever start. So anyway, I'm downloading it right now. So it's called DE1 NIOS Interrupt Keyboard Mouse VGA. So it's on, on there. Oh, here it is. So there it is, all right? So this week, what we will do is we'll go through this probably today and next lecture and get into SD card, all right? So again, if you haven't started on your project, you want to start on it soon, okay? Just because I can do it in two hours does not mean you can do it in two hours, all right? So just get started on it soon and uh, we'll go from there. Also, I keep emphasizing over and over, there are reference designs which you can, which you should look at, right? And I asked to computer systems, DE1, here's the media computer. So again, if you go under C drive, or wherever you install Altera, 13.1 service pack one, university program, right? Here are the examples. If you want the documentation, you can go under 13, whatever, again, wherever you install Altera, ah, Quartus, go under IP intellectual property, look at university program, and here's all the documentation and the hardware, HDL, everything, right? So if you look at this, it doesn't mean you're copying it, all right? It means if you're copying it, if you just blindly use it without understanding what's going on. So let's take a particular example. So let's say you want to record audio, right? So if you go under the media computer, if you go under app software, how, for example, if you go under media, and you can start with getting started, okay? Again, I'm going to use the hardware abstraction layer. I'm not going to use direct memory access. So you go in here, You can see that, uh, for example, where is the audio? If you go down, it's not here. It's not where it is. Media interrupt hal. Aha, here it is. Okay. So if you go under media interrupt hal, I'm just particularly looking for the audio. All right. So here it is. If you want. So here's an ISR which records and play, plays back audio. So it's very, it's very informative, okay, and very useful to look at. So it's all relevant to your projects. So what it's, um, I doubt if you can write like better code than this. Yeah, question. Huh? Yeah, it is. So here it is. So it's audio and service routine, right? So yeah, it's very useful right, to look through reference designs and understand them. So basically, not only are you copying, well, you're copying if you just blindly copy it, but if you don't understand it, uh, then when stuff doesn't work, there's no guarantee that you, no, you can't fix it. Right? It's not if stuff doesn't work, it's when stuff doesn't work. So, all right, so let's look at this particular design uh, but again, recall from Friday, I'll just redraw the block diagram so you have a record of it. So here is the, let's see, let me draw it from bottom up. So here's the NIOS2 subsystem. So here's the NIOS2 processor. So we have the fast version, is what I'm, that's what I'm using. And let's use the different bus. Actually. Let's cancel that. So here is one bus, here is the other bus, okay. So this is the Avalon bus. I can just put this over here. So here, here. So let's see, let me do it up here. 
So the key is Here is the Avalon bus. All right, so what we have, um, we basically have in here, I don't think I have on-chip memory anymore because I just doesn't fit. So here is the JTAG UART. Okay. Uh, Sys ID peripheral. Uh, what else I got? I got a timer, right? And the timer, I have actually, if I remember it, we'll look at it. I have timed it at 25 milliseconds because the refresh rate for the VGA controller is 60 hertz or something, 60 frames per second. It's around 16 milliseconds. Uh, so I've, I'm generating an interrupt every 25 milliseconds, right? So it takes 16 milliseconds for the VGA uh, core to completely read all the screen, I believe, but that's where I got this number from. So and these are the kind of things you should pay attention to as you're doing all these cores, right? In the sense, you have to really understand what each core is doing. So if you don't, like you just can't, blindly put this in right so you just just can't it's not only true for your uh academic projects it's true for real projects as well so think as you're doing this oops already attached it on this end so there you go i forgot what else i had on there um in the sense of the primary course but then let's look at um university program course okay so here's University. Hmm. I'll read it over here. So I'll use a different color. Let's see, red. So red is university program. Okay. So what I what did I have? I had the UIP. University IP or UIP. What does IP stand for? Intell intellectual property, right? So UIP clocks. And what else I got? I had a UIP, uh, let's see, car buffer for VGA. I got so I had a UIP uh, pixel buffer without memory okay so basically the char buffer has uses on chip memory that's why you pretty much run out of memory right the pixel buffer doesn't so for this we're going to use SRAM okay so I'm going to put the SRAM controller in there so here is UIP SRAM controller and there are going to be other cores right so I'm not gonna write that out uh, yet in the sense I really didn't um, think about it whoops as I was I didn't really think about it in the sense I didn't realize that we needed it until I paid attention to the messages it was giving and I read the documentation so let's leave it um, leave this for now then what we're going to have is also within here, we're going to have, whoops. An SD RAM controller. Okay. This is where our code is stored. And what else are we going to have? Let's see, under University IP, I basically recall that we talked about this UIP PS2 keyboard and UIP PS2 mouse, okay? So basically, we mentioned that here's the NIOS2 subsystem on the FPGA. I haven't connected all these cores. Let me do that. So this is the NIOS2 subsystem. Right, so 
we talked about on Friday, and this is where we left off, this ish question of could we do both PS2 keyboard and PS2 mouse at the same time, right? Uh, and after lecture, it took me like 10 to 15 minutes to figure this out, okay? And I'm not saying you should take 10 to 15 minutes, but you should know how to do it, right? So how do you uh, basically think about it? And this is not a skill that is taught in any school, right? It's just a skill. This is one of the things you get because of um, experience and practice, well, not only experience, practice out of thinking, right? So this is where you test if you can really think or not. So let's look at this. So as it's getting on, well, let it finish zip, unzipping. So one of the things I did was I looked at, so we all know, where's our DE1, there it is, the DE1 folder. We all know that the DE1 has a PS2 port, okay? So one of the first questions is, can I use a, is there a PS2 like splitter, all right? So for that, I simply Google searched and I said PS2 two port splitter and they do exist, okay? So here it is, for example, here's one. Okay, uh, so it's called as a Y cable. So, again, like I don't know if this emphasized in your other classes enough, right? This, this is not stuff that can be taught. Okay, it's just this is what makes this is what tests if you can become an engineer or not. If you can't think like this, well, pick another career, right? So, for example, so one of the first things you got to do is understand how this. PS2 splitter works, okay? So, no, it's not funny, I'm serious, right? I don't, uh, so, okay, since I put this up, if you think it's funny, what do you do when you see this? Like, do you just simply take this cable and connect it to the PS2 port? What do you do? Huh? This is a cable, there's no data sheet for this. So what do you do? No, this has nothing to do with a multiplexer, man. How do you figure out if this cable is going to do what you want it to do or not? Yes, that's right. So you got to figure out how it splits. So if you look at this, there's no data sheet for this. So if you look at appropriate forums, especially the Altera forum, turns out that what this PS2 splitter does is the PS2 protocol. If you look at the PS2 connector, right? So let's look at it. This is how it works, right? And to look at the PS2 connector on your DE1 board, you got to look at your user's manual, right? So where is it? Using the DE1 board. I think this is it. Aha, uh, no audio codec, 37, no, ah, PS2, there it is, this is what we're looking for. Okay, so here's our connector. So the way the splitter works is, so let me zoom in. So basically, there are actually two separate lines for the keyboard and the clock, it turns out. You need a clock and a data line, yes? There's a separate line for the mouse, there's a separate line for the keyboard. On this connector, okay? First of all, what kind of, what type of connector is this, male or female? Female, right? So you gotta know that first. If you don't, you buy the wrong cable, you're screwed, right? You're gonna be like, so what, it's only one buck. Well, when you go to industry, you'll be, in charge of like $500,000 equipment. So you buy the wrong equipment for $500,000, it makes a big difference, right? So anyway, so notice, so basically, I believe two and six are one device, okay? But the important thing is one and five are the other device. So on your DE1 board, are one and five connected? No. 
So if you buy the splitter without understanding what's going on, you connect a PS2 keyboard and a mouse at the same time, only one of those devices will work. And you will never figure this out if you didn't understand this. Because it's something, I mean, when you look at the software, you'll get data from only one device. And that's a physical issue. Right? It's just the way your DE1 board is wired. So this is an example. You see why you have to really think to understand this? It's, it's got to be mindful. Right? You just can't blindly connect stuff. It doesn't work. This is very clear. That's the point of this project, right? In the sense, I mean, I could go through, it won't take me that long to spend like one lecture on each of your projects. That's all it takes. That's not the point, right? It's not the point of me doing it because only I become better. So again, if you haven't started on your projects yet, start now. You can't finish your project the day before it's due. It just doesn't work. It takes a lot of planning and it's, remember, any problem, the first step is understanding the problem. This part of understanding the problem. So guess what? Splitter idea is out. That's what I figured out right, well, not right after, like, after 30, 50. After that, it took me, like, 10 minutes to figure this out. I just, and sometimes, like, if you're not careful, I mean, this is a very, this could be a very big problem. Right? I hope you realize that. So, well, so, what you could do, and this is what one of the engineers on the DE1 forum did, is you could actually connect these See, these are not connected. So what he actually did was un he identified, he or she identified which pins underneath your DE1 board were, well, underneath the connector on the DE1 board were connected to 1 and 5 using a continuity tester. He took a resistor from here to a GPIO, okay? So current limiting resistor, whatever. So he manually connected these to GPIO. Now, I don't recommend you do that because for PS2, remember they're not flow. They're you need pull-ups, yes. So basically, I what I'm. So this is what I decided to do, and there's actually a reference design on this, and I modified it. So let's look at it. Okay. So I decided to use GPIO for my other clock and data line, right? So I was going to connect the keyboard to this connector and the mouse to my um, uh, GPIO. However, I think 2 and 6 are actually the mouse line, according to the protocol. 1 and 5 are the keyboard line. So in my design, the mouse sometimes doesn't work, right? It was connected to the GPIO. So maybe I have to swap the mouse onto this actual PS2 connector and swap the keyboard onto the external GPIO. Right? But whatever, we'll talk about that uh, probably next lecture when I show you the actual hardware. I didn't bring it today. But let's look at the schematic, if you will. Where is it? So here it is. So let's look at the NIOS subsystem. Whoops, no, wrong. Let's look at software. I'm not going to open this up in Eclipse. just because Eclipse takes too long to open up. All right, so blah, blah, blah. So here's the reference I found. It was from of these guys who put emulators on the DE1. So hopefully this forum is still, and I can access this forum. I just want to show you the schematic and a potential problem with the schematic. All right, here it is. So let's take a look. There, all right. So, what I did, I, after this, I went to Val. I asked her for a PS2 female connector, and she had one. And I'll show this to you tomorrow, and I just did this, okay? I didn't solder anything onto the board. So, I used GPIO for power, and one of the things is, the 3.3 volts comes from the on-chip regulator. Sorry, not on-chip. The on-board, the DE1 regulator. And it's enough to power, I mean, the current... So sourcing and syncing, it can source and sync enough current for the PS2 connector. I made sure of this from the PS2 data sheet, right? These guys said it can, but I didn't trust them. Right? So uh, then data clock and ground lines. Okay. So is this clear? 
Now, something which is missing in this diagram are these pull-up resistors. Okay? You understand these are very, very important, right? Because the mouse expects, not the mouse, the PS2 device expects these lines to be floating high when nothing is connected, yes? That's the protocol, right? This doesn't guarantee that. So there's a way to get around this, and that's where we'll start our discussion of the design. So let's look at that. So one of the first things I did was I made, I mean, after this, actually simultaneously as I was doing this, I went into the, uh, I went into QSIS, I made sure if I can instantiate two PS2 cores. And I could, there was no issues with it, right? One of the cores I exported to the PS2 clock and PS2 data line. And the other, I exported to the GPIO, right? I'll show you that, but what I'm going to show you first is I'm going to show you how to, so these two clock and data lines here are connected to the FPGA via the GPIO, yes? So if you look at this, I think I used 17 and 18 only. Uh, well, let's check. Where's my hardware? So I use GPIO 1. Here it is. So 29 and 27, these are the ports, but these correspond to FPGA pins H17 and H18. Let's just check which is which. Oh, let's see, where is the GPIO? Ah, here it is. Yeah, here it is. GPIO 127, GPIO 129. Is pin, well, tw GPIO pin 27 is pin 817 on the FPGA, GPIO 1 pin 29 is pin H18 on the FPGA. Okay, however, as of now, these pins don't have any pull up on them. Okay, so what you could do is you can enable see FPGAs, FPGA pins, the FPGA is highly configurable you can enable pull-ups on certain pins. And the way you do that is you use the pin planner. You know, assignments, pin planner. And if you, once you're here, let's see, IO standard. Where is my GPIO? So here is 27 and 29. You don't see this pull-up column here. Okay, so the first thing you got to do is you got to enable it, right click, customize columns. Okay, so you right click and you go to customize columns. This is a general notion of what is called context, okay, in Windows. So if you want to get a context in any window, you right click on it. The reason why I mentioned that is on the Altera forums, um, I know this guy, he's very good, right? And he said, some guy asked the same question, and he said, via context, enable pull-up, okay? So the guy who he was talking to did not know what a context meant. So context means right-clicking. Right? So and that's what the other guy explained, the expert. He said, it's a general Windows thing. Um, but let's see. So the available columns, weak pull-up is not there. So in the columns we have here, these other columns, known name, direction, location, IO bank, all of this is there, right? So what we got to do is we got to enable, we, I mean, there's so many things you can do, right? So again, this is why you, you just can't teach. We got to teach concepts, all right? These are the concepts. The concept is FPGA is highly reconfigurable, unlike a microcontroller. So let's add this column, the pull-up resistor. And there's another thing I also just realized, which I've not done in my reference design. In this design, I might do this. Is, let's see, where's the weak pull-up? And you can see it says on because... I had enabled this setting in my reference design for the previous project, right? The project I posted online, the previous, that's what I meant. Uh, so, well, if you go to that week six to 10 on the zip file, I had it enabled there, all right, the week pull-up. That's how you enable it. Now, something important which I did not do is the PS2 protocol 
it basically goes off of 5 volts, okay, if I remember right. I mean, it says here on the, see, it's pulled up to 5. It's not 3.3. .3. This might cause another issue in the interfacing, okay. So these are all little, little things. I mean, this is real, well, it's not really real engineering because did any of you attend the, how many of you attended the in vivo presentation? Remember, so there are two, only two people who attended. But what did he say about formulae? You remember? Uh, Ashok said something about formula. Yovan asked a question about which formula do you use. What did he exactly say? You remember? Not only all of them, whatever is relevant. Okay? And the difference between academic, this is an academic project, right? The difference between this and a real project for starters is the money which is involved. How much was the funding for their project? Do you remember? The mechanical engineer said that. Two million dollars, right? It's a two million dollar project and their equipment which they demoed costs like 175, 200 thousand dollars. That's it's not a lot of, it's not a lot per, per cost per se, but like you'll be in charge of real stuff, right? And it'll happen immediately once you get out of college, assuming you go work for a company like Philips or in vivo who do like really interesting stuff. That, what they do is like really interesting stuff. That's next bio, medical, I mean, the guys who came were mechanical engineers and RF engineers. That's what engineering is now. It's a bunch of different, it's a bunch of amalgamations of different things, right? Yeah. So, it's, I mean, that, that is real engineering. So, this is, this is a, microcosm of it. So let me see if I could switch this to 5.5, 5 volts. What was it? 5, where is it? Here it is. I don't think I can. See? Because remember the FPGA is only 3.3 .3 volt logic. So this might be an issue, right? The way I, I mean, uh, basically the two issues, two potential issues are the more serious one is that this is not 5 volt logic. Right, there's no 5 volt pull up on this. Issue number one. Issue number two is the fact that in the PS2 protocol, I believe 2 and 6 are what the mouse responds to. 1 and 5 are actually keyboard. Okay? So the FX I'm seeing is my mouse, sometimes it doesn't work. Right? It never sends the uh, acknowledge back. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And these could be the issues. Right? So then you could ask yourself, well, if I can never do the 5 volt pull up from my FPGA because my FPGA is 3.3 .3 volt logic, well, then you can't, you have to use an, another solution, right? You really can't use this. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the more I think about this, uh, the, and they, if you read through this forum, they'll say they tried like three mice and it works. That doesn't mean anything. So it's, the fact is there are no pull-ups here. It's very, I mean, I don't know. They might have set the pull-ups in the FPGA like we did, but still there's only 3.3 .3 volts, right? PS2, is, it's 5 volt. Right? It's an older technology. So this might, this will, this could be an issue, right? So anyway, these are, again, uh, engineering. This is engineering, right? Okay, so what I did do is I went ahead with this. So uh, basically, like I said, I had, um, I mean, I went ahead with this for demonstration purposes to show you like a bunch of different concepts, like pull-ups, that is the configurability of the FPGA, right? And then the fact that uh, this is, this could work and you don't have to have an external uh, mouse driver and a multiplexer switching, right? Okay, so let's look at the QSIS. How much time do we have? To, all right, let's take a look. And then well, what we'll do is for today, we'll look at the hardware. Okay, next lecture, we'll look at the software. So I'm going to, for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to fill this in. All right, this is not enough. So let's take a look at it. And if it'll ever open up. So while it's opening up. Oops. Subsystem. All right. Oh, 
Okay, so yeah, I got some warnings. It's got upgraded. That's fine. All right, let's look at now all these connections. Okay, to do this, since I don't have my mouse. my mouse all right let's see if this works nope nope all right fine so here's my character buffer with memory so let's start with that that this do this guy is ch -ch -ch this fellow okay so because I want to display uh, characters onto the screen and I also have a pixel buffer so I can draw on the screen okay so what these two cores they do is they I mean each of both of them go into what is called as this alpha blender right so the foreground as you can see is highlighted comes from the character buffer yes should be able to highlight this but I can't but here it is this so the foreground comes from the character buffer. The background comes from the pixel pixel buffer, scaled appropriately. Okay. So again, there are, this is like engineering in the sense. This let's start since I said character buffer. Let's start with the character buffer. Uh, I said it's engineering because where we start out with just there's no hard and hard and fast rule. Right? So let's just see. Uh, so I enable transparency and the character resolution is 80 by 60. Remember, we only have 80 by 60. We don't have 40 by 30. That's for the touch screen, right? I choose onboard VGA DAC. So the output of the character buffer, which is a character source, goes directly into this alpha blender. So let's look at the alpha blender. And you can find all these under the university program. Okay. So go under the university program audio video video and basically what I used is the alpha blender uh, I also used character alpha blender character buffer right RGB resampler scalar VGA controller uh, dual clock FIFO and you'll see why each of these is necessary right so let's look at the alpha blender And there's a corresponding documentation that goes with this. So Alpha Blending Board is normal and there is simple. And if you look at the documentation, right, the video.pdf that describes everything, right? And that's where I got all these. I mean, there's even a reference design which does this. Yeah. It blends basically a character and a character buffer and a pixel buffer. So basically, why do you need well, why do you need these RGB resampler and scalar? Okay. It's because let's look at this. I don't know if the no, it's not in the alpha blender. Oh, let's see. The FIFO. Turn to the FIFO. Nope. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, let's just look at this documentation. Then go from there. So let's look at the documentation for the alpha blender. this will open up it probably won't so let's just manually open this up IP university program audio video video documentation and there it is video.pdf that's what this opens up yeah it never opened up that's okay that where the heck is this open up to there all right so video IP core descriptions there's the alpha blender all right so here the alpha blender core combines two video streams into one the two incoming streams called foreground and background are blended together to get an output screen. The foreground must be in 40-bit RGBA format, and the background must be in 30-bit RGB format. Okay. So your character buffer should basically put out 40-bit RGB, and let's see if it does that. Mm -hmm. 
enable transparency, blah, blah, blah. And it says somewhere in here that it does, okay? So the character buffer is fine. The problem is the pixel buffer. So let's look at what format the pixel buffer should be in. Where is my alpha blender? There's my alpha blender. So the background must be in 30-bit RGB format. So maybe we can look at the pixel buffer itself and figure it out. I don't think we can. Yes, we can. All right, so a couple of items. So the pixel buffer format space is 16-bit RGB, okay? So before that, if you read the documentation for the pixel buffer, where is it? Pixel buffer DMA controller, blah, blah, blah. Addressing modes, blah. So this is the RGB format color space. But the bottom line is, if you read through this, it'll tell you that the pixel buffer doesn't have its own memory. So you have to add memory to it. You can't use on-chip memory, okay? Because, well, let's see why not. So, unlike the character buffer, the pixel buffer has no... Okay, why doesn't the pixel buffer have no memory? This is an, why did they add on-chip memory? Why did they let the character buffer use on-chip memory and not the pixel buffer? Again, this is an engineering thing. Huh? Is it maybe it takes less or it actually takes less? What do you think? Huh? Okay, which takes more memory? The pixel buffer or the character buffer? Yeah, it's a bigger resolution. You're controlling individual pixels. Yes? So let's compute. Okay. Let me ask this question. Given... So note, so let me do this. And this is where I will stop. So let's compute memory requirements. Actually, let me use a different color. Orange, same color. So pixel buffer memory requirements. All right, so if you look at the options for the pixel pixel buffer. Uh, I have, I set it to 320 by 240, right? We want 640 by 480 at 30-bit RGB, yes? So why don't I just use 640 by 480 at 30-bit RGB? What do I have to do all this? I mean, I can still use an SRAM, yes? I can't use SDRAM because I'm using it for my code. How much memory would you need? So first of all, let's see how much memory we have on the DE one. Ideally, you look at the board itself, but then let's just see the user's manual. Uh, how much SRAM we got on that thing? Uh, I, I forgot. Right? I think it's two kilobytes. I mean, sorry, two, one megabyte. I don't know. Does anybody have the DE one with them? Open it. Just see on the board how much you got. Let's see if this tells us. Oh, 512 kilobytes, yep, right here. So you got 512 kilobytes, all right? And four megabytes of flash. SD RAM we can't use right now because I'm using it for code, all right? We can use this or we can use this, okay? So how much, what's the disadvantage with using flash as opposed to SRAM? Flash is slow, so forget flash, all right? So just use SRAM, 512 kilobytes. So, how do you compute how much memory you're going to take for 640 by 480 at 30 bits per pixel? Tell me the mathematical expression for it. Yeah, so number of pixels times bits. What is the exact expression for it? 640 times what? 480, okay, times 30 bits, 
So I want to compare it to kilobytes. Yes. 30 bits. Ah. So let's call this pixel. It is pixel. Times 30 bits per pixel. Yes. How do I convert it to kilobytes? Y by 8. 8 bits per byte. So, time 8 bits per byte, okay? Yes? No, that's correct. How do I convert to kilo? How many kilo? So how many kilobytes in like, how many bits makes a kilobit? Is it 1000? It's 1024, right? I mean, this is not funny, right? This is like a basic calculation. If you can't do this, you can't do this, right? This is, oh, this is not engineering. It's like basic, basic engineering. So these are what, again, in the Phillips talk, he said something else about back of the envelope calculations. You know what these are? These are the back of the envelope calculations. So ask yourself, if you can't do these, well, ask yourself, 1024 bits in one kilo bit, okay? So how much is this? Well, for this, you need a calculator. So let me whip it out. 640, oops. Ah. Uh, let's see. View, sign, stand. No, no, scientific. There. Oh, it is scientific, right? 640, ah. 480 times 30, yes. Divide by 8, divide by 1024. How much is that? So it's approximately, well, we can tell, say exactly how much it is. So, okay. 1,125 kilobytes. Okay? Will this fit on SRAM? No. And if you don't do this, you try to synthesize this, you know what will happen? First of all, will this synthesize? It probably will your data will all be corrupted because what the code will probably try to do, and we don't know what we don't know what it'll do. Like one potential solution, one put not solution, one potential thing it'll try to do is once you overrun your so it's almost double the memory requirement, right? So it'll probably over overwrite the memory again. We don't know what it's gonna do, right? But these are examples of back of the envelope calculations, right? Really, really simple stuff. Remember it goes back to what I said. You should know exactly what each and every one of your cores is doing. Okay? So out of luck. So that's why we are basically choosing a lower resolution, if you will, and make these calculations. That is 32240 16-bit RGB. Make sure it'll fit an SRAM, right? Quickly, by how much? So again, back of the envelope calculations. So if I use, again, I don't want you to compute this. So we are more than double the requirement, right? If I do 322, 40, 16, by, how, by what factor am I going to reduce this? How much? Eight. Half here, half here, half here. Boom, eight. So it'll work. You don't even have to recompute it. Right? Guaranteed. So these are, again, these are the kind of things that should go Okay, in industry that's worth a damn, there nobody maintains lab notebooks. Okay, but what is important is this calculations. Right? These are very important because when the product fails, it's not if it's going to fail. Your manager he or she will ask, "Where are these calculations?" If you don't show them to them, if you don't show it to them, you're screwed. Right? Classic example is if you haven't heard of this, and this is where I'll stop.
Have you heard of this Sean scandal? You should read up on this, okay? Holy crap. All the ads in Wikipedia now. So this guy basically claimed he published like 30 papers full of crap, right? It was just nonsense. Nonsense and our nonsense. So he used to work at Bell Labs, okay? So basically, when they found out his was full of crap, right? Uh, be, uh, his managers came to him and asked him, where is your lab notebook? What that means is not a lab notebook per se with like objective, no, no, that's not what they asked. They asked, where is your data? He didn't have any. This is science, right? But this data is equivalent to exactly this. And once you make, you finish the back of the envelope cal calculations, you put it in, you document it, right? Not only do you document it, you make backups of it. You make backups of backups. I'm serious. This is all like, you know, I, I went through it, for example, last week when a colleague, not a, some guy from some university read my paper and it wasn't a mistake. There was a misunderstanding and I clarified it. It's because in my paper, I mean, it was there, whatever. Right? I also had data to back it up. You don't know who will, it's not somebody will ask. It's, this is the right thing to do. This is very clear. This is very, very important, right? When you do your senior design, whatever, these are the kind of things that should be there, documented. All right, so what we'll do is we'll continue next time. And next time we'll look at, we'll finish up this hardware and then we'll look at the software. Go from there. All right.